Okay, hi friends. Let's see. All right, I'm gonna wait for some people to get on. Sorry about the little phone delay. I swear I watched Tim C's video. <laughs> Um, while we're waiting for some people to hop on, I figured I would just tell you guys a little bit about me and who I am. Uh, my name is Tara Carter. I've been working with Clay ever since I can remember, but formally I was trained um, at Otterbein University, graduated in 2011. I know I have a baby face. <laughs> uh, let's see. I majored in studio art with a concentration in ceramics, photography, and sculpture, but ceramics has always been my love. Uh, so bear with me here. I'm trying to pull up my live stream on my computer so I can answer your questions as they come up. But please uh, feel free to ask away. I will be watching and I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, today what we're going to be doing is learning how to make marbled pinch pots. Uh, so I have an example here of one piece of my work. This is made with a white clay body and mason stains. Um, it's something I've been working on for the last year or so, and it's been really exciting just to see how it evolves um, or how it has evolved so far. So um, while you guys are on there, why don't you tell me where you're watching from? I think this is so cool and a huge thank you to Stacy and Tim for doing this. Um, I've loved watching all of these demos. It's been such a fun experience. So thank you guys. I mean, what you're doing is really important and really exciting and keeps us all connected, which is important right now. Hi everyone, thank you so much. I love seeing your comments. Florida, how cool. <laughs> um, so today we're gonna to be working with Laguna Frost Porcelain, which I figured um, would be a fun clay to explore. I've heard so many people talk about how much they can't stand Laguna Frost Porcelain. Uh, so my goal is to make this a little bit more approachable for some people who have trouble throwing it. I started making pinch pots, gosh, let's say about two years ago. Um, I was a wheel thrower. That was always what I liked doing in college. But um, I started working at an art school full time and started teaching a lot of kid classes. And if any of you have taught ceramic classes to kids, um, you would know that pinch pots come in handy a whole lot. So after about the 400th pinch pot, they started looking better and better, and I've just been exploring the whole process since then. Um, oh, cool, Portland, Oregon, that's awesome. Hi, Jennifer. Um, I am in Telluride, Colorado. It is a beautiful mountain town. If you've never heard of it or been there, look it up, it's worth it. Um, I'm really, really fortunate to get to live here and uh, work for a nonprofit art school here but I am originally from Columbus, Ohio. That's where I grew up and went to school and all that good stuff. I moved out to Colorado about three years ago. And I have to tell you, being at the stay at home order, it's kind of nice being in Telluride. I'm, we're still allowed to go out and exercise, so I was actually just hiking up a mountain this morning, um, which was a ton of fun. And for any of you who follow me on my Instagram account, which is you pinch it, you pot it, you'll see that I'd make a lot of these pieces on the trail. So the cool part about this process is you can take these little pieces of marbled clay anywhere. Um, I have hiked up on the top of mountains to make pinch pots. I've done it in the desert. I actually made a pinch pot on a ski lift. I'm a big snowboarder, so <laughs> that was definitely interesting. I've um, been snowboarding and pulled off into the trees, filmed a pinch pot video, put it in a bag, and then skied back down to town with it. So. If you wanna see some pinch pots in action for sure, uh, let me know and head over to my Instagram and check those out. All right, so I don't wanna to waste too much time, but these are all pinch pots. I just wanna highlight that fact this year. I've been trying to get more complicated forms. Um, I'm really proud of this teapot, except for the fact that the drainage is not exactly tuned in. I could have done a better job with that, but hey, isn't that like a ceramic artist? We could always do a better job. <laughs> Okay, so the first step of creating these marbled pinch pots is to add mason stains directly to the clay. So this is kind of a spin off of agate ware. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, instead of using multiple different um, or different pieces of colored clay and combining them, I am combining mason stains into the clay itself directly. And when you wedge it, 
Um, you can see all of those colors combine in what I think is a really beautiful way, beautiful patterns. Oh, thanks for asking, Cody. My Instagram is you pinch it, you pot it. So Y O U pinch it, Y O U pot it. <laughs> People ask me where I came up with that name, and I have to tell that story, and I'll do that while I'm wrapping my bag of Laguna Frost porcelain, which I saw someone commented, commented yes, it is very finicky. <laughs> So hopefully you guys will enjoy seeing a pinch pot version of it. Um, I've had more luck with keeping my pieces alive and without cracks when I'm making pinch pots with it. Um, okay, let's see. So my Instagram name, that was what I was talking about. <laughs> when I was growing up, like I mentioned earlier, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and I have family that is from the South. So I have a memo and a pebble. And Memo would be in charge of watching my two brothers and I, who kind of struggled with staying out of trouble. <laughs> uh, so she would be in charge of following us around in different malls and shopping areas and just kind of yelling behind us, hey, you break it, you bought it. You break it, you bought it. Tara, you break it, you bought it. <laughs> So when I was trying to think of an Instagram name for my pottery and I was developing this whole new line of pinch pots, her words just kind of kept playing in my head and I liked the sound of you pinch it, you pot it. And it describes my process pretty well, as you guys will see. All right, so I have my big uh, loaf of Laguna Frost porcelain in front of me. I did cut this down a little bit just so that it fits this awesome tool. And people always ask me where I got this. I got it from Sheffield Pottery. It's called, um, I think it's just called a slab cutter, but it's kind of magic and you guys will see why. So instead of measuring out or weighing out my pieces, I typically use this slab cutter. Oh geez, now you're gonna see where I really have to put my muscles into it. <laughs> I use this slab cutter, which essentially turns this loaf of clay into like a, la a loaf of sliced clay. Sometimes I have to get my, you know, backside into it. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> and here's where the real magic happens. So I just push that slab cutter, or cutter through this. And now, when I pull it all the way through, ta-da! Now I have a whole big bunch. Oh God, I hope I don't break my pottery. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of slabs that are all the same shape size, thickness, it's kind of magic. For teachers out there, this thing is such a lifesaver. Being able to cut an entire bag of clay into all of these look nice um, cohesive or what's the word I'm looking for, consistent slabs is such a time saver. So again, Sheffield Pottery, I think it's just called a slab cutter and it does exactly what it says. Now normally if I was making a big batch, which is what I typically do with this colored clay, I would lay all of my different slabs out onto a table and I would, I would uh, wedge up a whole batch at once. So I would use similar mason stains and then I would have about 20 or 30 balls of clay that's all marbled that I could take with me out of the mountain to pinch. <laughs> all right, excuse me here because I'm not gonna wedge up the whole batch. Yes, Denise, these things are incredible. It's, it's such a time saver, <laughs> especially for kid classes where you're having to do a lot of the prep on the front end. All right, so like I mentioned, typically I would spread out and use this all over the table, but today I wanna show you guys my whole process from start to finish. So it's gonna be a bit of a cooking show format. I hope you're excited for it. <laughs> All right. Got that bag back. Let's see, what's the best way for you guys to see this? Because I'm gonna be working with mason stains, I'm gonna put on some mask or a mask and some gloves. Um, there's been a lot of research about encapsul encapsulated mason stains. Um, supposedly they're a little bit safer to work with, but you know, better safe than sorry. And given the times we're in, I just feel like I'm such a trendsetter now with having all of these masks and gloves around the studio. <laughs> I hope you all are staying safe where you guys are. And the mason stains that I chose today, um, I've got a couple different varieties. You can get these from, 
think I've got it from the ceramicshop.com. Um, I don't, I think bigceramicstore.com sells them too, but I've got a variety of uh, brands, two Laguna Mason stains and then one by Mason Color Works. I'm going with earth tones today because I feel like being more connected to the earth is a good thing for all of us. We're, we're all in it together and this is a crazy time. <laughs> all right, now I know <clears throat> Everybody loves putting on these masks, safety first, my friends. So I'm gonna show you guys, <laughs> hello. I'm gonna show you guys how I sprinkle the mason stains on, but you're not gonna be able to hear me too well. So if you have any questions, now would be a great time to ask them and I can get to them once I'm done sprinkling. Just to give you an idea of what I'm doing, I'm taking these mason stains and I'm sprinkling them directly onto my slab of clay. I don't measure out using a scale, Maybe I should, it would probably save me a lot of money and materials because you'll see I use quite a bit of mason stains. Uh, but what I'm going for is one thin layer on top. I'm just coating the top part of this surface. So you guys are gonna see how I do that. And see me look really cool. <laughs> this is my favorite part. <laughs> All right. Got our green. Peacock. <laughs> and the last is just a nice brown color. Okay, <laughs> and I'll answer you in just a second, Carrie. I, I'm in a bit of a Darth Vader mode right now. <laughs> but I wanted to show you guys about how thin that is. Very thin, I'm just coating the top surface of this. After I have my mason stains on the clay, I'm gonna roll it up like a sushi ball. <laughs> ah, thanks, Denise. <laughs> That's what it looks like. <clears throat> that was fun. <laughs> All right, so once I've rolled up my whole batch, because typically I am working in batches of like 20 to 30 slabs all rolled out, I either use the same mason stains to color up a whole batch. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like cinnamon rolls. I like to think of it as sushi as well. Um, usually I make a whole big batch of these, but sometimes I'll mix up the colors so that I can have some variety. Um, my process is pretty involved. It, it's not super time consuming, but it takes multiple days to do each step. So once I've rolled up my cinnamon rolls, as Cookie says, oh, I love that. <laughs> um, once I've rolled them up, I'm gonna put them all in a bag and just let them sit for a minute. Um, this is one of the secrets of my process letting the clay have time and letting the mason stains in particular have time to suck up the moisture from the clay is key. So at this point, I'm gonna put them away in my bag <laughs> and then I'm gonna pull out one that I have already prepared for you. I told you it's gonna be cooking show style. <laughs> so this has been sitting in, um, in a bag. I can already tell it's a lot more um, moist, you know, it's gonna be easier to work with than it is if I pull them directly out or if I just start wedging them completely. It gets a little tricky. So the next step, maybe I should solve my mask on. Well, I think it's fine. The next step is gonna wet, or I'm gonna wedge this piece. So I've got my sushi roll or my cinnamon roll. The first thing I like to do is just tap directly onto the surface and I do the same thing on the other side. The main reason is just to try and seal all the mason stains that are inside here in the piece of clay. So <clears throat> now I'm gonna wedge a little bit. 
How long in the bag? Good question. So at least 24 hours, but honestly, I've left them in there for days. Um, I think the longest I've left it in there is a couple weeks. And the longer you let it sit, as long as you don't have holes in your bag and all that moisture is staying in there, the better. So as I'm wedging, just want you guys to be able to see, um, I want to wedge until the clay no longer is splitting and letting mason stains come out like it's doing here. Instead, I'm going for it looking more streaky. I want all those mason stains to be incorporated into the clay before I start pinching it. Otherwise, when I start making the pinch pot, I'm gonna have seams burst open and then the mason stains kind of spill out. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is a piece that I've held on to because I didn't think it was worth selling or sale worthy. You can see where the clay has spit or split. It'd be funny if clay spit. That'd be kind of awesome actually, keep itself nice and moist. Um, you can see where it's split and I have mason stains coming out there. That's a fault, we don't want that. <laughs> the way to prevent it is to keep wedging until you see this is no longer splitting. I wanna keep going until it starts getting streakier. Yes, Jenny, you can do this with B-Mix. So the majority of the pieces behind me here are all B-Mix. It gives you more of that like creamy color compared to the frost porcelain, which is a nice clear white. The other thing I really like about the frost porcelain is the translucency of it. You can actually see the mason stains sitting inside the clay, which as a clay dork is so exciting to me. <laughs> it also makes me feel less wasteful about all the mason stains that I use. All right, so continuing to wedge this piece. Oh, we're getting close. So you can see now, instead of it looking like the clay is splitting, these mason stains are starting to streak through the clay. That's what we're going for. Super streaky. Ow! Sorry, that was a really lame joke. <laughs> All right, and I can tell I'm close. I still have some mason stains that are sitting a little bit loose in there. Honestly, it's like anything else. The more you do it, the more comfortable you become with the process and the more sense it makes. Okay, so this is pretty cool. <clears throat> Um, so now I've got my piece. It's super streaky, but you can also see I'm getting really close to wedging this too far. If I wedge this too far, it's gonna turn into a big muddy mess. And I see Kelly's question, can you throw that on the wheel? Um, you could, but you're gonna get more of a muddied surface because you've got raw mason stains in there. If you're, um, if you're throwing on the wheel, you get that spiral effect. You're adding a ton of water. It just doesn't seem to work as well as the pinch pot method or as slab built cups, which I'll show you guys an example of that as well. It's something I've just been doing like recently. Oh, thank you, Brenda. <laughs> this is a really fun process. Um, you can also use, uh, gosh, Amico Velvet Underglaze for this with kids. You can paint on underglaze on top of those slabs, let it sit out and dry, and you'll get a similar effect. It, it adds a lot more moisture to the party, so you might have to let it sit for a little bit longer, but you can totally do it. We've done it here. <laughs> All right, so here's my other cooking aspect of the show. I've got my piece, I've wedged it where I want or where I want that marbling to be, and again, I'm gonna set this into a bag and let it sit for at least a day. The longer the better, as long as it's sealed completely. Okay. Is there an alternative to wedging available? Huh, that's a good question. You know, I know running things through a slab roller and then compressing them with a rib afterward might be a good alternative for you. Um, you can take these pieces directly from the sushi roll stage and roll them through a slab roller. You're not gonna get quite the effect, like this is a piece that I did yesterday that we're gonna work with for our pitch pot demo here. Um, you're not gonna get quite the effect. It, it kind of looks like, um, what's the best way to describe this? Like a marbled pinch pot got ran over <laughs> and then it dragged the clay. It's almost like a screen printing drag with the color, but yeah, you totally can. Um, and especially if you do have wrist pain, you know, pinch pots are probably not the best method. It, it does, it does take a toll. 
yeah, slamming the balls around, you can do that too. Just uh, be careful of flying mason stains. <laughs> All right, so um, you can see on this ball, my last one was getting a little bit muddied. I took a wet sponge and just wiped the surface on or uh, wipe the surface of this ball away so that you guys can see the colors that we're working with. And I'll talk about that more later because that is important as a final step. Because our hands are on these pieces for so long and, and so often, um, it's really easy for the surface to start and get, or to start getting really muddied and gray. And we wanna avoid that. All right, let's make a pinch pot. <laughs> so the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is pound this ball into a perfect sphere. And what I like to do is just look at the marbling on the piece and see what's interesting to me. Like I like this little bit here. So I'm gonna try to put that on the outside of where I'm pinching my vessel. I wanna think about the shape at this point. Um, yes, Terry, you can use other underglazes besides Amico. Anything that doesn't have the glass component in it, it's good stuff. All right. So the first step for making a pinch pot is to make what I usually call like a fat hockey puck. <laughs> so you can see with my right hand, which is my dominant hand, I'm squishing this ball flat. And with my left hand, I'm just taking those sides and sucking in the belly. If only it was that easy. <laughs> I want my hockey puck to have more up and down sides. It's really common when you're making pinch pots for them to get really wide and just open up and turn into a plate. I'm gonna show you guys how to avoid that and how to make taller forms. Um, this is one of the taller pieces that I've made as a pinch pot and it's about the size of my head. So there is a way uh, and I'm gonna show you. <laughs> All right, got my little hockey puck. Now what I wanna do just like I would on the potter's wheel, I wanna make sure that I'm opening this piece up exactly in the center. You really only have one shot to do this. If you go in on the side, your walls are always gonna be uneven. And what I like to tell people to do is to use the bobblehead technique. So you're gonna put one thumb up and then I'm gonna put that ball of clay or that hockey puck directly into the center. Hence the bobblehead. <laughs> All right, so the first step on pinch pots, one is to look, all right, that looks pretty centered. You know, I might wanna go the other direction with my thumb just to kind of even that out a little bit more. A lot of this technique comes down to feel. It's no different from any other form of pottery, except for maybe slab building. Um, it's like throwing on the wheel. A lot of it is just feeling how thick the walls are, getting comfortable with that, and then pushing it to the limits, especially with this frost porcelain, you can really get these suckers thin. Um, cracking becomes an issue, but we'll talk about that more <clears throat> in a bit. So what I'm doing now is I'm pushing my thumb down on the bottom and I'm using my four fingers on my opposite hand to push down and sandwich that clay in between my two hands. It's no different from throwing on the wheel, we have to compress the bottom. And because we're trying to make this a tall piece, we wanna do all the work that we can on this bottom area before we move up. Okay. So I'm gonna keep pinching as I'm turning. See if you guys can get a good or a better angle of that. Tell people it's like that, oh, you're talking too much. Uh, am I guilty of that? <laughs> um, you're gonna use that motion. That is going to be your best friend when you're making pinch pots. Just going around, I'm not thinking about spreading the piece out too much right now. I'm just compressing the walls and I'm also compressing the bottom. So I can feel with my thumb and my four fingers on this side that the bottom is all about the same thickness. That's the goal. We want all of our walls to be even. And the cool thing about frost porcelain and also the really difficult thing about frost porcelain is it's like cream cheese. I mean, you can push that thing wherever you want it. Um, it's like a lot of other clays where it's very stubborn and it may, it may not like that. <laughs> so listen to the clay. You know, I've, I've never, never once been able to outsmart clay. <laughs> it does what it wants to do and it's best to embrace that. All right, so the bottom of my piece feels pretty even. Um, again, I'm not really focusing on the walls right now. I'm just thinking about the bottom. And now the next thing I wanna do is create a foot. So I'm taking my thumb and my forefinger 
and I'm pinching as I go around the bottom. And you can see I've got this nice little foot forming. I like to glaze the bottom of my piece because the, the marbled clay just looks so beautiful with a clear glaze on it. So for me, having a foot that's raised enough that I can glaze and decorate this bottom part is really important to me. All right, so I've got my bottom foot, you know, not perfect, but I wanna make sure that I get through all the steps of my process before I leave you guys today. We're already halfway through, crazy. <laughs> now we're gonna start making this piece taller. So here is the secret. I think when a lot of people are trying to make pinch pots, they just naturally push their hands like this. And if you can see how I'm pinching, of course that's gonna come out at an angle. So a lot of people see their rims cracking and their pieces getting wider and wider, wider. I want you to think about rotating your hand in, okay? It's kind of like when you're throwing and pulling up the walls, you're almost pulling in towards the center because the force of the wheel is forcing it out. Think about the, this in the same way. The other secret, I think about my pinch pots like I would a multiple level building, like an apartment building or something like that. I wanna pinch completely around this piece on the first level before I move up to level two, before I move up to level three, four, five, so on and so on. So what I mean by that is I'm getting back to my you're talking too much uh, motion and I'm gonna put my thumb on the inside, my four fingers on the outside. You can do it either way, it really doesn't matter. I tend to switch it up because it's just more comfortable on my hand. But I'm just gonna pinch and rotate, okay? I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate all of your guys' comments. You all are so nice. <laughs> like trying to pretend I'm not super nervous. All right, and you can see I'm going on on the other hand as well. And I'm just pinching, 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 and I'm going only, oh, thank you guys, you are the best. <laughs> I'm pinching all the way around on level one. And now that I can feel that the walls are all the same thickness, which is about the thickness of my pinky, that's what I'm going for, I'm gonna move up to level two. So I was on level one, I pinched all the way around, I can feel that it's nice and even, and now I'm gonna move up to pinch level two. Oh, thank you, Barbara. Yeah, I've really enjoyed playing with this technique because I don't think there's anything like um, wedging that gives you this marbled look. You know, a lot of the marbled pottery that I see is typically thrown on the wheel and you have those beautiful swirled pieces and they're absolutely gorgeous, but uh, this is just something that I've kind of stumbled upon that I don't see anyone else doing, which is really exciting. <laughs> well, thank you guys. You guys are so nice. <laughs> Should just uh, bring you onto my social media channels every time. <laughs> All right. So already you can see the more I pinch, the more interesting this marbled pattern comes out to be. Really cool. You know, I don't know how else um, you would get this kind of flowy, organic look to it. I've seen like Peter Pincus porcelain, if you guys are familiar with his stuff, which is just so unbelievably gorgeous. Um, he does some really cool stuff pouring different colored slips into plaster molds, which is really cool. Um, but again, there's nothing that I've seen that, allow that allows you to put multiple colors directly into the clay itself and see what happens with it. It's really cool because like most of you, when people ask me, oh, can you make me two or three of the same piece? My answer is no. <laughs> uh, especially with this process, it's just so tough to know how it's gonna turn out. Even pieces that are wedged with the same exact color combinations could come out really different. I've had pieces that are uh, wedged with rainbow colors like this one is. Um, and then I've seen pieces, you know, that come out yellow with the same colors in there. How much clay is in that ball? Um, it's, I don't have an exact measurement of it. It's one of my slabs that I cut earlier. I think just based off of the weight of it, I would say it's a little less than one pound. So maybe like three quarters of a pound. Uh, so again, I just want to point one thing out, um, cause this weird little mushroom shape is exactly what we want. <laughs> This is keeping all of the clay above where I'm pinching. 
so that when I do get up there, I have more area and more clay to be able to grow up. That's the important thing. Um, yeah. It's kind of like when you're throwing, when you have two hands and you've got that big lump of clay that's just traveling up here. Think of this weird belly section as that same principle. I'm keeping the clay there so that as I travel up the piece, I can pinch it more and more. And again, I want to avoid pinching out. I want my hands, <laughs> I want my hands to be rotated in. That's going to help me get more uh, vertical walls straight up and down. I know you love rainbows, Chanel. <laughs> so awesome. All right, so I'm just continuing to pinch and pinch and pinch. And like I said earlier, the best part about this is I can do them anywhere. So you guys are looking at the studio that I work at. I uh, work full time for a nonprofit art school. I'm a youth curriculum manager, so I teach primarily kids classes, but I also teach a handful of ceramics classes for adults. And I uh, just kind of took over the ceramics room since I got here because I'm a big clay nerd. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, after I make all of this clay or, or wedge up or marble up a bunch of clay, I can take it home and I do the majority of my work sitting on my couch. <laughs> Either that or I take it out with me. Like I was saying earlier, I pinch them on trails. I pinch them on ski lifts, um, in the car. It's really nice to be able to take it anywhere. Oh, thanks, Jenny. I am so missing them right now. It's been hard. We're um, trying to figure out these virtual classes, which again, I'm so grateful to Stacy and Tim. I think this is such an awesome resource that I've been able to share with the kiddos that I work with and our adult students. Um, and I just, I would love to see the world embrace it. It's such a cool thing that you guys are doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, Amy, ski lifts, I've pinched. Let's see, I think I've pinched three pieces on a ski lift, um, and then I've pinched another three or four pieces in the middle of the mountain, and then I have a plastic bag that I'll carry with me and snowboard down. <laughs> it's pretty fun. All right, so my walls are getting pretty even. You know, I can sit and fuss with this for hours and hours and hours. I'm not gonna do that right now because I want to show you guys the rest of my process, there are a few more steps to get through, um, specifically with glazing. But I am just going to point out one thing. You can see the top or the rim is starting to get some cracks. I think people are very um, quick to add water at this point, but use your finger like an eraser and I would take care of those cracks as they're popping up. The more you can do this as you go, the less likely it is to crack as it's drying, which for any porcelain, but especially with Laguna Frost porcelain, that's something that I've struggled with. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love sculpting in Starbucks, that's great. Yeah, I've definitely gotten a few looks of people like, what is that girl doing? But um, I don't know, I think there's something really cool about melding together some of your hobbies. I'm somebody who likes to dabble in a lot of different things. I love to snowboard, I love to hike. Um, just recently I started playing ukulele in the bass. <laughs> I think having, for me as somebody who tends to fuss and kind of really obsess over my work, it's nice for me to have other creative or um, athletic, I guess, or active hobbies. It just takes my mind off of things and then allows me to be a beginner. I think that's super important, especially if you're a teacher. Um, take those opportunities to try something new. I have learned so much about how to talk to people and how to describe my process from putting myself in their shoes in a different kind of um, activity. You know, I don't know anything about bass, but it's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, Elaine, our house is definitely not afraid to have clay in it. I thought about doing the live demo here, but the mason stains into the clay is a part of the process that I don't do at home. I, I care about my boyfriend. <laughs> he's very patient. And for the last two years, he's been learning how to play banjo. So we are like the most annoying neighbors ever. You know, he's playing banjo and I'm sitting there playing with dirt on my, on my couch. <laughs> We're not dull, that's for sure. 
Okay, so this gives you a better idea of what that surface looks like. And I'm gonna show you guys another piece that has dried a little bit. Um, it's really fun after I've done the sculpting on this piece because it looks cool, you know, it looks all right. But after you wipe away the surface, it really turns into something special. So because I have my fingertips, you know, all over this clay and I'm touching every single aspect of it, I'm picking up mason stains as I'm going and it gets put on other areas of the surface of the clay and it makes it look a little muddied. So at this point, um, what I would typically do, I told you my process is pretty lengthy, lengthy. It's not all that time consuming. It just has multiple days involved. At this point, this is what I would call the first round of pinching. I would put that into a plastic bag, just let it sit for a while. The more that this can sit, the stronger it's gonna be and the less likely it's gonna crack. After it's sat in plastic for at least a day, but again, I could sit you know, for a week or more as long as the seal is good. I'll take it back out. I'll make sure that the rim is nice and smooth. At that point, once it's stiffened up and a little drier, I might add some more water or just a touch to smooth out that rim. But the more water you add, the more likely it is to crack. Kind of the same with pottery or with a uh, wheel thing. All right, so at this point, put it in a bag, let it sit for a day, and then I would bring it back out, continue to fuss with it. Lately, another cooking show part. Lately, I've been playing with some leather stamps and I've been trying these more geometric shapes combined with the natural feel of the clay and the marbling. Um, I love these pieces, but for me, I just am looking for that one extra piece. On this one, I did some gold luster in the cracks, and I, and I love how that turned out, although it's a little bit sloppy on my part. But to me, I was just kind of looking for something else to put onto the surface to make it interesting. I'm really into balancing opposites. So if I can have something that looks very organic, almost looks like stone, and it has these very geometric, careful shapes stamped into it, I think there's just um, a story behind that. There's something to it, which I think is cool. All right, so <clears throat> I've set my piece aside. I brought it out later, I fussed with it. I got it to be, you know, the shape that I want. These are wine cups. Um, I love drinking wine out of handmade ceramics. I think that coffee and wine in particular just taste better coming out of handmade mugs. And I know there are so many potters right now that are struggling with in Sika being canceled and all of these shows that they really rely on. So if you guys see some potters and you have the means, please support them. There's so many great online sales going on right now. I just bought, um, what was it? Clap Thor Robots. I bought one of those mugs, which is so fun. And I've created a little bit of a mug wall and essentially all the money that I make selling pottery, I just tend to spend on pottery. <laughs> I got my second Brett Kern dinosaur lately, which or just recently, which was so exciting. Um, the kids really get a kick out of that. <clears throat> okay, so after these have dried a little bit, you can see the surface just isn't all that interesting. It looks um, muddy to me. So I take a sponge, make sure it's nice and wrung out, and I'm gonna wipe, and hopefully you guys can see, away some of the mud and muck off of that surface and it reveals all that beautiful marbling. Let's see if I can get closer for you guys. Give you a good look, especially at this at the top. So this is another part of my process I don't typically share with people, so thanks for tuning in. <laughs> um, I've had some people who've tried making these marbled pieces, which I really encourage because they're a ton of fun and it's a cool effect with not all that much effort or complicated tools or anything like that. Um, yeah, but I don't usually give away this part because <laughs> to me, this is kind of the make it or break it moment. All right, but you guys are clay buddies, which means you get in on all the secrets. <clears throat> so this part in particular had a lot of gray on the surface and taking that extra step to wipe it away Revealed that beautiful blue streak, which doesn't look all that interesting now, but once you put a clear glaze on this, it's gonna pop. Okay. Cool. Oh, I need to keep an eye on time because I don't want to run over. Awesome. Okay, 
So that looks pretty good. You know, this is another part of the process that I can fuss and fuss with. If you are worried that you're gonna wipe some of the mason stains into the other pieces of, or into the other areas of clay, um, I've also used sandpaper. Um, I was watching a live Instagram demo by Tim Kowalczyk and he was talking about how he uses sandpaper on bone dry wear. And that just blew my little pottery mind. So <laughs> I have tried that, but I tend to use the sponges because of the dust issue. You know, I just don't want to add more dust that I'm, that I'm breathing in. We definitely don't need to contribute to that. Oh, cool, Gretchen, I'm so, I'm so psyched that you guys are inspired. If any of you make some pinch pots after this, please look me up on Instagram and tag me. Um, again, my handle is you pinch it, you pot it. I would absolutely love to see what you guys made. Um, I'm gonna keep wiping this as I just tell you a little story of what we did recently in my job. I told you I'm the youth curriculum manager here, but I've also just kind of inherited the ceramic studio at this nonprofit art school that I work at. Um, and when we had to shut down our doors because of this whole COVID business, we decided we were gonna do a pinch pot project with the community. So um, I pre-bagged like 30 bags of just one pound balls of clay and left them on our porch after fully sterilizing them and then did a live Facebook demo on how to make a pinch pot. I think that was like last Thursday. Um, so those pieces all of that clay went out to the community and they watched that pinch pot demo and we're starting to get them in. The part I didn't mention is we had such a big response that we ended up giving away 168 bags of clay. <laughs> so right behind my phone here, I've got about 60 pinch pots that everyone in our community made. And it is just so cool to see. It's um, really approachable for people who aren't comfortable using clay or thought that they wouldn't be able to make something, make a cool piece. Um, you know, this is something I'm really proud of these forms. I love seeing the little fingertip marks. When I hold it, I can tell that it was made with somebody's hands. Um, oh, Michelle, that's so cool. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. You're gonna, you're gonna have so much fun. It's really a playful process. It's very experimental. Um, you're not gonna know how it's gonna come out. But one thing I do wanna point out to you guys, for those of you who really enjoy carving, or stamping in different shapes. This works really well for my glazing technique, which I'm gonna get into now because I don't wanna run out of time. Um, for glazing my pieces, this bottle shows it pretty well. What I like to do is brush in a different color or a different glaze. Sometimes I'll use under glaze, sometimes I'll use a cone six glaze that combines with the clear glaze that I use in interesting ways. You know, as potters, we can't ever stop experimenting, right? Um, but typically what I do, I paint on that glaze or brush on that glaze. Sometimes I'll dip it, but it's a little bit wasteful because I then wipe it away so the glaze only stays in these cracks. And let's see if I can find an area, I think maybe that shows it a little bit more, where it's kind of seeping out of those cracks and into the clear glaze. Um, and I would show you the inside of that, but it's not really gonna demonstrate what I'm trying to show you guys, which is, all of these cracks that happen on the surface, I embrace. You know, some people get a little worried about that, like, ooh, is that gonna crack all the way through? Um, see if you can see inside of there. It most definitely does not. And the reason why, you know, I'm not exactly positive on the science behind it, but I think, <laughs> I think clay naturally wants to crack. Um, so when you're using this method and you're doing a pinch pot, my thumb is always on the inside and that's creating like this little greenhouse effect. So it's never really getting dry. It's staying moist and I've never had problems with it cracking all the way through. The surface tends to crack, um, most of the time because I'm pinching these outside. So it's getting the elements onto it. And for me, there's something so beautiful in that I, I want to embrace the, um, nature's effect on these pieces, especially when I am making them outside. So for me, the cracks are something to celebrate. They're not something that I smooth out. The only exception to that is on the rim. I will take time to smooth that out so you guys can kind of see. You know, it's not a perfectly uh, level rim because that's kind of boring to me. Sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't say that's boring because I collect pottery, so I have a ton of just impeccable forms like Renee Lopresti, have you guys seen her work? Oh my God, I bought one of her coffee mugs and 
it is one of my prized possessions just because of the precision on it. I mean, that is a rim that you could balance something on. Um, but for me, again, these are pinch pots. They're supposed to be organic. They're supposed to be um, filled with character. And that's what I think makes them so special. Doesn't mean that I'm not very careful and meticulous with all the parts of the process. It's very important to me that they're made in high quality. Um, right, just recently I've been showing these pieces in some different galleries, which blows me away that people are excited about it. But um, the best part about this is sharing it. You know, I, I, I'm pretty giving with all of my pottery secrets because <laughs> I think the more people that we can get their hands in clay, the happier we're gonna be as a society. There's something about getting connected with clay that gives me a lot of peace and joy. And, and as you can tell, I'm kind of a high energy bubbly person. <laughs> So putting my hands in clay just forces me to slow down, forces me to pay attention to things. Um, and I haven't found anything else that really does that for me. Okay, I've got um, a little less than 15 minutes, so I wanna show you guys my glazing technique. Um, you've seen what the finished product looks like, but here's how I do it. <clears throat> All right, excuse. Here's the last little cooking show aspect. So this is a big pinch pot um, stein that I was working on. I had every intention of entering this piece into Companion Gallery's Last Call exhibition. I ended up putting a wine cup in there instead, um, which, oh my God, I'm in Companion Gallery. <laughs> like that was such a high point for me. I love that gallery. If you've never looked at them, they are just incredible. It's, I've, I've spent so much money there because they have the best work. Um, but anyway, I was intending this to be like a big beer stein for last call, but I just couldn't stop fussing with it. I don't know if you guys can really see. I knew you would like the Chanel, <laughs> but it's all rainbow colors in there. Um, and again, when the clay is at this stage, which is bone dry, it's, it's much more dull than what the colors will look like once they've gone through the firing process and once I've put on the clear glaze. The clear glaze is really magical. <laughs> all right, so... Let me grab my glaze. So I've told you, sometimes I will just bisque fire them after I wipe these pieces down and sand them. Um, sometimes I just put them directly into the bisque because it's just easier to work with. And if anything cracks at that point, it's usually gonna crack in the bisque firing. So I don't wanna put too much time and effort into the pieces. Um, <laughs> sounds good, Chanel, that's great. Um, what I'm using today, I don't typically use underglaze with this, although sometimes I will. Typically I'm using like black iron oxide, red iron, red iron oxide, or another glaze, cone six glaze that combines with the clear in a cool way. But I definitely have used a watered down version of Amico's Velvet Underglaze, which is what this one is. Um, and for you fine people, for my clay buddies, I'm busting out the flame orange, so you know it's about to get real. <laughs> Just thought that flame orange would be a fun thing to paint onto this surface. So typically, you know, I don't take all that much time doing this. It can be sloppy, because if um, you picked up on it earlier, what I'm gonna do after I've painted a whole layer on, is I'm gonna let this dry, and then I'm gonna wipe it off so it only stays inside all of these beautiful cracks. Oops, sorry, let me. Get a little closer to the camera. <laughs> and I love like just adding the water, you can see how much the mason stains start to pop on the surface. Um, so I guess I'll tell you guys, as I'm finishing painting up this surface, I'll tell you the story of how I started making these. Um, I had, I, I think I had already told you guys at the beginning of this feed, I had done about 400 pinch pot demos in the summer working with kids. And then I started just liking the forms so originally I was just making pinch pots in different forms and then experimenting with glaze combinations on it um, like I had always done with my wheel thrown pieces. And then I had just stumbled upon this box in the back of our clay studio that looked like it hadn't been touched in five years. And I opened it up and it was just like, ha! Ah. <laughs> it was like 15 different baby food jars of just all these different mason stain colors. So. It was more of just a reaction to seeing that and being excited about all of those possibilities um, that led me to adding it to clay. I had 
I was prepping for a kid's class that I was teaching, so I used that little slab cutter I showed you guys earlier and had a bunch of slabs ready to go for my class, but that cutter will, um, let me change my grip so I don't break my handle. Um, that, that cutter will slice up a whole bag of clay. So I think I only needed like 12 pieces for my class. So I ended up just kind of playing around with the others. And one of them, I think I made like a slump mold piece. And then on one piece, I remembered all those mason stains. So I just sprinkled it directly onto it. And I believe the first one that I did was all blue and white. So I just used one, um, I think it was vivid blue, the stain, which is a beautiful stain if you're wondering which ones, you know, I, I like the most. <laughs> vivid blue is pretty awesome, peacock is too. Mazarine, oh my God, that's so cool. Um, and after I put it onto the slab, I just kind of sprinkled it and then looked at it a little bit and thought, okay, what now? And then I rolled it up and decided to just go home and think about what I wanted to do with it. And the next day I came back and wedged it and it looked really cool. I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna pinch it. And it made the coolest pattern, so I was really psyched about it. It came through the bisque firing and I hated it. <laughs> I thought it looked so boring and it just, it was not what I had imagined as the stone marble quality that I was really looking for. Um, it was boring. So it just sat on our bisque shelves for, I don't know, months and months. And my job here involves um, loading our kilns and unloading our kilns. So I needed a couple more pieces just to fill up a kiln in order to get pieces out for a class. And um, I decided, all right, I'm just gonna throw a clear glaze on this and see what happens. You know, I'll use it to catch dog treats or something, I don't know. And they came out of the kiln and it was one of those moments that I, like all of you guys I'm sure have had when you open the kiln and you just do this little happy dance and this weird squeal of excitement of, oh my God, I've just discovered something new and I love it. <laughs> so that was about two years ago and I've just never stopped playing with it since. Um, I've added more colors in at a time. Chanel is very aware of my rainbow obsession with these pieces because I just love showing off the mason stains. Gives me a chance to play with color theory as well, which can be a challenge when you're working with ceramics and it's much more about glaze chemistry. Yeah, Amy, I agree. You know, I, that's one thing I tell my students, like never stop experimenting, even if you have a piece, especially adults who are working on the wheel for the first time, um, they're so hard on themselves <laughs> and I, I don't know if they take this well, but I end up telling them like, hey, just make it anyway. You know, it doesn't have to be a perfectly thrown piece. This could be one of those wabi-sabi um, vessels and maybe alter it afterward. And who knows, you might lose it in the glaze kiln anyway. So use it as an experiment and a chance to learn and grow. You might just surprise yourself sometimes, you know, glaze it. It's the worst that could happen. All right, so now while I was blabbing, you can see my wash has dried on the surface. And again, I recommend doing this once the piece has gone through the bisque kiln already. It's just easier to work with. Um, that, and when I'm starting to wipe away, yeah, you can see it's just staying in those cracks, which I think is so cool. When I'm starting to wipe away, if I'm using a bone dry piece, all of a sudden I have to start thinking about, you know, how much water I'm adding to the surface. I love this piece because of how much it cracked. I just, I think the surface is so freaking cool. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm drawn to things that are maybe a little weird, maybe a little out there. Doesn't look, um, not that any hand-thrown pottery looks commercial to me, but I'm more interested in pieces that make me question what the product or what the medium can do. It's kind of cool to me. All right, see if I can give you a better view of what's happening, all this magic. I mean, look at that area, so cool. I don't know if you guys can see. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus on that. You can really see the layers of marbling. It's just so awesome. Okay, I wanna watch the time. I wanna make sure I'm not going over into this next person's. So I'm gonna quickly explain, and then if you guys have any questions, now is the time to ask, please, I'm an open book. Um, thank you so much for letting me just completely gush and dork out over this. Um, I'm really proud of, of having developed this, and 
I think it's a cool technique and I would love to see more people embrace it. Again, slab work works really well with it. Um, if you wedge up that clay and roll it out. Oh, I meant to point this out to you guys earlier, but this was a slab built piece. So I started it as a slab cup and then I pinched the form to get it. Oh, good question, Suzanne or Suzanne. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, it isn't smearing because I have wedged the mason stain into the clay itself. So if I have, you know, when I'm doing this, if it's still wet and I'm working with it, it might smear a little bit, but most of the mason stains that you're seeing are actually clay. You know, it, it's, it's wedged in, it's incorporated with that clay itself, so it's not wiping all over the surface. If I don't wedge it enough and I have loose mason stains, it absolutely will smear all over. So getting that wedge technique correct is a little bit tricky. And if any of you are wanting to try this, please reach out to me and ask or, you know, feel free. My Instagram is the best way to get in touch with me, but you can also check out my website is terracarterclay.com. Um, and then my email address is terracarterceramics at gmail.com. Thank you guys so much. I had so much fun with you. Um, you guys are the best. So yeah, thank you for the reminder, Barbara. I use a clear, bright, um, clear glaze. It's cone 5.6. These all get fired to cone 5.6 and it's called clear, bright. I think it's a Laguna clay, but to be honest, I'm not positive on that or a Laguna glaze. I'm not positive on that. Um, so just one more time, show you the finished product. You know, this one's got black iron oxide, so I love how you can see almost the yellows coming out of some of those cracks too. Oh, Jacqueline, <laughs> you saw my little owl hanging out back here. So I make a lot of pottery and I typically sell it online, although I'm holding off on selling things online because I'm really fortunate to have a full-time job right now. And I think if we are supporting ceramic artists, we should all do that for the people who have online sales. I'm gonna hoard my stuff and make it available later, but. I'm also a sculptor, so I just had a sculpture show, and this is my little owl. <laughs> and Christy, so I, I typically dip in my clear glaze, and it's a really quick dip. You know, I'm not, I don't want to have a real thick glaze on there. And I'll show you one last bird, because I think I've got like one more minute. <laughs> so I'm actually a huge bird watcher. I teach a birding class here at the AHA School for Adults. I love birds. I think they're super cool. <laughs> you can tell that was like really cool in high school, huh? <laughs> Here's my Stellar's J. So this is a bird that hangs out in Telluride. I just did a show here in Telluride with Telluride Arts District. Um, I had about 15 of these different birds on display. Super fun. So I'm somebody that has to have like multiple art forms that I can bounce and back and forth on or I get a little bored. But um, thank you guys so much. I think that's my time. I had so much fun. Thank you for letting me blab on. If you have any questions about my process, please reach out to me. I'm so happy to help. Um, and again, if you try it out, please tag me. I would love to see them. <laughs> thank you guys so much. You are the best. And I will be tuning in the rest of this week. Huge thank you to Tim and to Stacy for putting this on. And thank you for all of you clay buddies. You guys are the best. I am so appreciative. Um, yay. Have a great one, guys. Stay safe. Stay creative. Wash your hands. I love you all. <laughs>